Well, I grew up on the golf course. My mom and dad both played golf. I have two older brothers. We were a golfing family. Uh-huh. And uh, I I played, and I I was pretty good, and I got a lot of attention. And I loved the attention. <laughs> that's, that's to be honest, you know. I, I loved traveling, you know, competing into tournaments and in, in tournaments and and uh, winning. I, I was addicted to the competition and, yeah. and playing well. And so uh, I started playing. I had a club in my hand when I was three years old. Mm-hmm. So I've been playing for, what's that, 29 years. <laughs> <laughs> you're a solid 33. I can't even do exactly. the math right now this exactly. way, damn it. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Uh, so I mean, just, wow. Uh, so so since the age of three, that's that's like Tiger Woods level of yeah. investment into. Except I, I don't have a tape of me and Bob Hope, uh, <laughs> you know, where I was making putts. But, uh, and I grew up in a little town in Missouri, so you know, I didn't have the opportunities that he had. And uh, speaking of of women in sports, uh, golf and tennis were about the only opportunities for women in the '60s and '70s. Mm-hmm. And uh, although we had organized softball, and uh, when I was a freshman in high school, we started the very first basketball team. We wore the guys' jerseys. I mean, it was crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, but, they could have had you out in dresses instead. Like, well, the, that's I, true. I, you know, I, I think about that. Like, the wait, what is the movie that Rosie O'Donnell was in? Yes. A league of her own. There we go. That yeah. you know that that like my mindset. If it, if it wasn't one where you're completely you know you know unprovided for, right. that it's the other side where you where it's complete objectification. And anywho, sorry, I don't right. need to go down the. <laughs> no, it, and you're exactly right. But uh, golf was uh, you know it was acceptable, and we had a I had opportunities. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I mean the the family being in it did with was that. Like a generational thing, or how did uh, how did your no. or was it your my parents? Dad, that... My dad uh, played because he was a caddy when uh-huh. he was a young a youngster. He was a caddy and an opportunity to make a little money, and then uh, he loved it. So my mom realized that she needed to play golf if she was going to spend time with him. So um, and I, being the youngest, mm-hmm. I just they just took me to the golf course. I, mean, <laughs> I didn't have an opportunity to say I did want to go, I didn't want to go. And it was a little nine-hole golf course, and everybody had their own golf cart, so I got to drive, and I really liked that. <laughs> and uh, we used to wear metal spikes back then, and I loved the sound of the metal spikes on the concrete. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd go see my friends that were in the pool, but I'd have on my metal spikes, and I was cool. What is what is some of the most, like, uh, absorbed sensory activities from the golf course. I mean, you talked about the spikes on the concrete. Are there other things that just stick out in your mind as like, this is the essence of golf to me? Um, the feel of a really good shot coming off the club. Mm-hmm. It's really kinesthetic. I mean, you can, you can feel it just goes through your whole body when you hit it solid. And so, you know, the sound of the, the spikes, obviously, you know, when I was, Young, that was cool. <laughs> but now I'm gratified by just the feel of a really good shot, which That's... doesn't happen too often anymore. <laughs> but, they, but they're still there. And I tell you what, um, I think this one's going to be a good shot. Episode 73 of the WTF Carbondale podcast, where we talk to interesting people about their interesting lives and tie it all back to this little old place we call home, Carbondale, Illinois. Episode 73, Diane. Will you say your last name for me correctly? So I don't, because I, I want to say, like, I want to draw it out and be like, Doherty, but I don't and know if that. That's, that's close enough. You know, I'm not sure I say it the same name, <laughs> the same way every time, but it's just Diane Doherty. Diane Doherty. And it, there we even go. though it's an A, I, you know, it kind of goes an O in there, and it's a lot of people spell theirs T E R Y, I E R T Y. But I answered anything. <laughs> Just hey, coach. Yeah, I'm I'm the coach, and right now I'm I'm better known as the puppy peddler from St. Francis. Oh, it's such a such a when we will get into St. Francis, uh, full full tilt, no doubt. But but before we get to St. Francis, both in this com- both in this conversation and in in your life. Coming to Carbondale had to be one of those things, and we talked about coach just as well. Um, who. I'll address my shortcomings in Charlotte's podcast with her. I'll just say I'll say that. But but um, you know, was it was it Charlotte that that brought you to Carbondale initially, or was it something else that brought you to Carbondale initially? Well, I was playing professional golf and I uh, had terrible knees. I mean, I'm in my late twenties mm-hmm. and I just had a lot of knee problems. Ended up having surgery on both knees, and the uh, surgeon said, "If you want to walk, you need to find a new profession." Mm-hmm. And so I I thought 
all right, you know, I'm going to live vicariously through my team. I'm going to coach. Yeah. And uh, I luckily had gone to graduate school and I had a, a master's in sports psychology. So coaching was a good fit. Mm -hmm. I applied for three jobs uh, that were open at that point. Uh, this is 1986, okay. so uh, I'm not really 33. But uh, <laughs> I went to Dartmouth, and I got off the plane. It was below zero, mm -hmm. and I was like, I've made a mistake. You know, <laughs> Give me out. This Give me is out. not happening. And Northern <laughs> Illinois was also open, and uh, that was just not as good a fit as Southern Illinois. Yeah. I have a brother in St. Louis. You know, I'm from middle Missouri, so I'm four hours at that time. Oh, My that's, parents are both yeah. deceased, but, you know, it was four hours from them, so... I thought, all right, I'll come here. I'll be here uh, two or three years, and I'll move on and coach at Arizona or some big school. Mm -hmm. uh, but I got here and uh, fell in love with the place, uh, really put my stamp on things and mm -hmm. made it my program. Mm -hmm. And then I wasn't going to leave my program. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how that works when you get so ingrained in a project that you were never sure where your, where your, you know, timeline existed to begin with, that it becomes so much you and that, you know, I, so I don't know a lot about sports. I've never been a sports person. This is very much my speed, the stage and, and performance is very much my speed physical movement not so much <laughs> but but watching something that that is uh, got universal appeal like the Michael Jordan documentary right right and he talks about uh you know going to Chicago because he saw in his mind like this team that he was going to build and this this program that he was going to ultimately own is that is that something that is that is just uh, ingrained in some people that are that are at the at the leadership level in sport um well probably i mean it happened to me i got here and and we didn't have a, a supply room or anything we mm -hmm. had there were like four light blue shirts that said <laughs> siu girls golf on them mm -hmm. well our colors have never been light blue <laughs> uh you know the bags were embarrassing it was it was just uh, we needed help yeah and so I have the gift of gab, and so and I'm loud. So, you know, I got to where, you know, we were raising quite a bit of money each year and, mm -hmm. and getting better. And, you know, when you recruit kids, they want to know where you're going to go and, you know, what kind of uniforms you wear and how mm -hmm. you travel. And so it wasn't long that we were able to recruit a better type of athlete because mm -hmm. we had better things. Yeah. And uh, then we won conference championships and – and this was my home, and and I was proud of our program. How does I mean how how did just the the environment of of the town fit into that recruitment component too? Because it's it's a twofold deal. It's it's both the the school and the program, but probably also the place where folks actually get to live while they're participating in these programs. I always uh, felt like if I could get them to campus, yeah. I could sign them. Yep, because. Um, you know, gosh, back in the heyday when we had 25,000 students mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, that was uh, that was awesome. And, uh, you know, if I could get them here and see the beauty of the campus yeah. and, uh, you know, we've got great golf courses around here. So it uh, the worst part is the major airport is two hours away. Yeah. So it always really, you know, that extra two hours of traveling and stuff was tough. But uh uh, I always felt like if, and I did, I, I had very good success. If I mm -hmm. got them to commit to a visit, we you would usually sign them. Now, it, that's you bring up an interesting point about the golf courses, right? Because I, and again, not being a sport guy, I don't have the the context on it. But are are we kind of a, a golf rich area for kind of where we're at, or is this, or is it just as common to have kind of you know smaller, large towns, right? Still have you know two, three, four you know, decent sized golf courses in and around them. We have a lot for our population. Okay. Uh, we didn't, when I came here, Hickory Ridge wasn't built. Oh, yeah. Stone Creek, which yep. is now Keller's Crossing, wasn't built. Cocopelli wasn't built. Mm -hmm. It was basically Jackson and Crab. Okay. But uh, then, you know, Hickory came along, then Stone Creek, then Cocopelli. So we are probably, um, we probably have too many golf courses uh, <laughs> for the population. Uh-huh. Um, but... You know, it, it makes them lower their fees, but they yep. still all are making it, so we're okay. Good deal, good deal. And I, and I hadn't thought about that, right? I, I think of it in the context of, well, this is what's here now, so it must have always been there. Yeah, but that's no. not, not at all the case. No, no. <laughs> Matter of fact, I was um, 
it, it's an interesting story because I we George Whitehead was the head of the park district, mm-hmm. and we were trying to get Hickory Ridge. We needed a public golf course, uh-huh. and so nobody was running for the park district position. So I did as a write-in candidate just to get the the golf course going. Uh huh. So I was I was uh, and then I was sued by another write-in candidate. <laughs> it was a long story, but anyway, yeah. I attended one meeting, voted yay for the golf course. Then I got. Uh, disbarred from the park district because all the misspellings of my last name got thrown out. Uh huh. So a guy named Brad Woods won. Huh. But I still was the the cast the the vote that that uh, pushed Hickory Ridge into being. So I'm really proud of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's that is cool. Well, yeah. you know, so this this leads into another conversation, and, and I will you know the. Let me know your your comfort level in discussing this because I don't know how far along it is, right? But the um, but the the funding model for Hickory Ridge, um, you know, I've heard some talk of the the change and and people wanting to contribute privately to the success of the of the golf course publicly, and I, I don't know if that's something that you're a brisk of in in recent years at, at all or, or if that's something that if you did know you could discuss I'm, if, if not I'm gonna cut this part out but <laughs> I, I really don't know anything about that that's I fair. know that that they keep borrowing against the bond yeah so it looks on paper like Hickory is not successful yeah and this big hole that keeps losing all this money mm-hmm. but uh, Hickory is what financed the splash park yeah uh, you know it it really is much more profitable than it looks on paper because they keep borrowing against yeah. it. Yeah. Well, and, and if it's if it's your property that can carry your debt, then that's it's right. a workhorse as much as it is exactly. anything else. Uh, that's that's interesting too. And I, I I guess I didn't realize that that depth of it with um uh, with the golf course. Um, you know my my I, you know, I I just in my mind thought oh well there there had been debt that rolled over and this is what happened. But no, if it's if it's the property that you leverage. To that's finance other things. That's yep. what ha- it, it, it looks <laughs> terrible on paper. Yeah. But it's not. Yep. It, it finances a lot of the operations of the park district. Well, and it, and if it not looks all of them. It, and it looks really good, like physically oh, in person. Oh, Hickory's beautiful. Yeah. It's a you know I was was lucky to be in with the the architect of it. I hit the uh, first ball off the imaginary first hole, <laughs> and then when it opened, I actually got to hit the first ball off the first tee. Uh huh. And watch the progress of it. So that was exciting. Ah, I mean, and that—that that is, l- what long being able to see what long-term investment in a project like that yields, and I think that's the perfect segue <laughs> yes. into the the life that you live now with Saint Francis. So you just want to give me the story of Saint Francis from the from the start and work me all the way up and through it. Well, as early as 2000, uh, there was ne- there was not a no kill shelter uh-huh. in the area. And uh, John Cook, who owns Cook Port of Warhouse, mm-hmm. would, you know, they have a factory out in Anna. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people would dump their dogs there. Really? Okay. And so he was the real driving force. Mm-hmm. And he got a hold of me and Denny Court Camp and uh, really uh, Teddy Miller, who was John's daughter. Mm-hmm. And we were the ones that started St. Francis. We were... Uh, in somebody's backyard in Anna for a little while. <laughs> then we raised enough money to buy the property where we are now. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a little white house that we thought, oh my gosh, we have died and gone to heaven. This is awesome. Yeah. Well, pretty soon that house started falling apart. And then we, we uh, in, I guess it was 13, we borrowed a half million dollars to build the new building and made the commitment to just be a great no-kill shelter with a full-time veterinarian, Mm -hmm. uh, the area's only low-income spay and neuter clinic, and it has taken off like I never thought that it would. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, John didn't live to see this happen, but uh, he was really the driving force behind it, and uh, I'm I'm just so proud of it. Yeah. Well, and I'm I'm sure it helps having having – uh, a, a big stick to carry in with you from the get-go, but also somebody that's going to want to work into it, right? To understand that there is there is power in having some of these folks, you know, really help and drive the project, but also that, you know, their willingness to invest that sweat equity in it is just as valuable as anything else that exists out there. Oh, we are so fortunate that we have, uh, you know, we have people that donate, and then we have people that just work their tails off. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we made it through the pandemic. 
Uh, we average 80 adoptions a month. Wow. Um, I had to sign the, the half million dollar loan. So far, they haven't <laughs> taken my house. <laughs> so we're making those payments. So um, it's just really, uh, it's, it's just, it's awesome. I'm, I am as proud of, of what I did with all the young ladies because you know coaching golf mm -hmm. i just co i coached people yeah i coached young ladies it just happened to be that they played golf yeah and so you know i'm so proud of my relationship with uh, 25 years worth of young ladies yeah and so you know i still you know keep in contact with them matter of fact one of them and and their two daughters is coming they're coming to visit next week from atlanta oh, that's great you know i keep in contact and so i'm so proud of of that more than I am, you know, the rings or the conference championships. And then now the saving of the lives of a lot of unwanted pets. Yeah. So let, let's, let's touch on some of those, some of those rings. Cause I like that. Yeah. The, what, so the, what, what year was your first championship pursuit? Uh, I came in 86 mm -hmm. in the summer of 86. So it would have been 87 and we won our first championship in 88. Oh wow! So that yeah. was pretty rapid development. The uh, the nice thing about that was they were all pretty spread out, and I'm I'm not going to be able to tell you the years. No, that's fine. But uh, the the thing that Tulsa was in the Missouri Valley, mm -hmm. and they had the premier women's golf program in the country. Mm -hmm. So for about five years, everybody was playing for second. Yeah. You know, they had Nancy Lopez, and they flew everywhere in private jets, and, and they won national championships. Well, mm -hmm. you know, SIU, Illinois State, we were not going to beat yeah. Tulsa. So we played for second. So even though we have five conference championships, we have five second-place finishes that I'm just as proud of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that would that would do it if you are if you are legitimately playing, just knowing we, that. We knew we were playing for second. They, <laughs> you know, everybody went to – to Tulsa for one or two years, went on to the LPGA, uh -huh. and uh, it was a it was a pro uh, factory more than than to get your degree. Yeah, which you know, whatever they're they're <laughs> making lots of money in the LPGA, but you know we had uh, I probably had in twenty five years I'm going to say five young ladies that didn't graduate, and that was about it. Yeah, I mean, what what is that relationship between uh, the sport activity and education? look like when folks come here i mean even for especially from your coaching standpoint that you've got to both be that 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 competition guide but also that life and school and all of the other components that kind of comes along with it because well i mean i, I guess on, on on top of you know the the actual functional component of of coaching that you've got folks that are relatively young coming to you as well that are relatively impressionable and you get to fill them with all sorts of good ideas about what they can accomplish in life. It, uh, it's a little different coaching golf because they're usually upper middle class families. Mm -hmm. And so I was, uh, I was fortunate in the fact that most of them had good steady habits. Yeah. They, uh, you know, where they were, were raised properly where, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have a lot of, of, uh, trouble with, with, uh, them not going to class. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was very fortunate, but I would tell them when I recruited them, you're going to get your degree. Yeah. If you go on to be a superstar on tour, that's great, but you're going to do it with your, your degree. <laughs> Did you ever have anybody push back against you with that? No, no, no. They, you know, they were, they knew that they wanted a, a degree. Yeah. They knew that. So no, I was really very fortunate in, in the fact that I didn't have to really come down. I, I think, uh, it's funny, um. There's, there's a young lady that I put her on house arrest. She could only leave the dorm to go to class. And now she's the one that calls me more than any of the rest, you know. So, but she knew that, that I was, it was a, a, the hard hand of love, uh -huh. you know. I was looking out for her best interest. <laughs> Dare I ask what gets you put on house arrest? <laughs> well, um, for her privacy, I, enough, it, was, it was just an accumulation of things that she need not be doing. Very good. So I, uh, <laughs> I put her on house arrest, and I would check up on her. She could go to class, and she could go to practice, and that was it. <laughs> but now, you know, she's a mother of two beautiful little girls and very yeah. successful in her career, and... Uh, she she realizes that that hard hand of love that I gave her or, or kind of uh, held over her for that time yeah. was life changing for her. Yeah, 
I mean, and that is, I've had a mix of both, uh, you know, professionals from SIU and students from SIU on the podcast at, at all different places in, in, in their careers and in their, and in their schooling. And there always seems to be this common thread of how much somebody at this school has cared for a pupil or a student or a person on campus that's needed it. And it's just, you know, I, I, you know and I can't say that this doesn't happen at, you know, plenty of other institutions, right? But it feels especially special in this place. Um, I agree with you because we really didn't, you know, there were a couple of professors that were not happy about all the classes yeah. that they would miss because we did miss a lot of class. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually, you know, like I would take a test on the trip, get them in my hotel room, time them, you know, take the test back to the professor when we yeah. got back. They were mostly very cooperative with our student athletes. But I think because you know, I had good student athletes, so, you know, they were, they were willing. Yeah. Where, where, where is the furthest that you ever reached out to? Like where the furthest that you ever recruited from for the, the program? Was it well, national I, or? I found that, uh, I had better success with my program and with the community and, you know, support mm -hmm. fundraising. If I got the best kids out of Illinois, really? I wanted for every young lady who played golf to grow up and say, I want to play golf at SIU. Yeah. And that was my goal, to get every young, good young lady around, you know, Chicago, St. Louis, even though it's, you know, yeah. but I'm from Missouri, so it, I didn't yeah, it's, consider it's, it's that. Yeah, it's ballpark. It's within, it's within yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. distance. So, um, you know, the, the furthest that anybody ever came to play, I had a girl from New York, and I had my best golfer ever came from Atlanta. Mm-hmm. But uh, mostly, I recruited the best kids out of Illinois. Ah, oh, that's that is one for homegrown talent. Yeah, that is that's good. Yeah, I mean, and, and we just we I, any anytime somebody's like, oh, Chicago, it's like, hello, look 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 at us down here. Yeah. Like we benefit greatly from having the nation's third largest metro area here like that gives us access to so many folks to come build our community with that we wouldn't have otherwise if we were in less populated states right just, exactly you know kelly gerlach she just got inducted into the hall of fame two years ago uh -huh. she's from sparta yeah you know i had local kids i mean just and i'm you know that that made the program yeah getting um illinois and local kids ah uh, i mean that's it just makes sense. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> you know, and then you and you are you already know everybody's already kind of hooked in. You get you get the whole families on board as well. Oh well, you're gonna be you're gonna be just as close to home as you need to be. Yes, you're 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 within access distance. We can come see the games when you're playing yes. at home. The important components to it. Yes, because oh. a lot of times people would say, "Oh, I don't want to come. I don't want to play golf in Illinois. I want to play golf year round. I want to go to Florida." Yeah, and I'm like. Do you really want to play golf year round? <laughs> Do you want a don't, break? <laughs> yeah, don't you think you need a little break mm -hmm. and you know you work on your studies and you know it's playing golf year round. I've done that. It you get burned out. Yeah. Uh, so you know, a little reverse psychology on that, and you are close <laughs> enough to home to go home and do laundry and and uh, have a home cooked meal, but you know you're still not living at home, and so it was successful. <laughs> Good blend. So you were you were talking about. It, Coming coming out of being a, uh, so what was it was it the LPGA that you were in coming out of out of the the pro circuit into yes. teaching? But, or, so did you follow a, a course similar to your students in making sure that you went through the educational function and were able to pursue professional activity al along with it as well? Like, is it is it something that you were able to to model having done yourself and then taking it to these students and saying, hey? Look at me. I'm the success story. You can be the success story, too. It helped. It, I think it, it really did help because uh, maybe I had a couple players that beat me every once in a while, mm -hmm. but not very often. <laughs> you know, I could always beat them and I could always show them shots mm -hmm. and course management and, you know, how to handle nerves because, you know, I've, I've played in U.S. Opens. I've played in the biggest 
tournaments there are. So mm-hmm. I know what it's like to be nervous. <laughs> what What is that pressure like? I mean, when when the cameras are on and the crowds are on the green and the banners are flying and announcers in 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 towers and whatever else it all it all looks like. I mean, what is what is that kind of feel that you have when you when you set foot onto a course? Well, never having had the lead or really the expectation to win, mm-hmm. um, I didn't feel the pressure that probably, you know, a lot of the superior athletes felt, Mm -hmm. you know, I was just trying to make a living. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, I was fortunate that I did have a background in sports psychology. Mm -hmm. So I knew about the breathing and, and, you know, trusting the process and that probably, uh, helped me and it helped my coaching more than anything, because you've got to, you can't get all, engrossed in that you're on TV Mm -hmm. and that this shot means, you know, whether I'm going to win $10,000 or $200, -hmm. you've just got it. You can't think of that. Um, so, you know, you just try to do one shot at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a big golf. Um, everybody says one shot at a time in the (laughs) golfers, but it really is true. Yeah. The only thing that, that can you have, you worry about in golf is your very next shot. Mm-hmm. Can't do anything about the one you already hit. Can't do anything any you know about a hole that you don't like that's coming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the very next shot. So you kind of uh, compartmentalize all of that. So it's just that shot, and and you have to just kind of block out everything else. Is that is that a, a very applicable function in the um, in the shelter work as well? Like it's literally. The pet that is in front of you now is the pet that you can do the most for. Work on it just pet by pet by pet. You know, I've never thought of that, but it probably is true because, uh, you know, as much as I would like to save them all, we can't save them all. Yeah. If uh, we took every pet that we get calls about, we would need to be 20 times larger Mm -hmm. than we are. And we already, I already, I already have to raise six hundred thousand dollars to keep our doors open. Yeah. So, that's a lot. That's a lot of money mm-hmm. uh, for an area that we don't have major industry that yeah. I can go to. You know. You just say, hey, John Deere, can yes, I get <laughs> John Deere, IBM? I need ten thousand dollars. That's not happening. Yep. So you know, we we every dollar is important to us. And so, and we, and people know that. Yeah. No donation is too small. So what, one of the things that I will do with this, and, I, and I've done this with a handful of, of, of other folks, like talking to Chris from the Science Center and um, had, uh, had a, uh, uh, other, other friends on with, with other, uh, that represent other nonprofits in, in different ways. But something I can do here is take this podcast and turn it into a fundraiser. And I think this is going to be one of those things where I can benchmark, well, what, what happens when I have somebody on from a very – with a, from a from a nonprofit that has a very strong fundraising following already, right? Because you you've been able to establish a public presence uh, through social media that has delivered dollars to the door, um, and and I just I'm, I'm interested to see how how that you know uh, uh, how that plays out tied to this media, but more so just kind of the 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 broader. Uh, concept of of how fundraising has changed over time as the internet has gotten more robust with the tools that you have available to you to say hey i've we've just had these you know um these animals come into the shelter we we have this need for food we have this need for supplies to put that ask out there and have that ask immediately answered by folks it has been unbelievable when facebook first started uh I know in athletics, we were kind of against it because, yeah. uh, you know, people were posting pictures that we deemed inappropriate. Yeah. And, and so it was a real struggle. Mm-hmm. And then it was like, OK, we need to embrace it. And yep. then we can make rules about, you know, what, what kind of pictures you post if you're yeah. over 21 or whatever. <laughs> but uh, I see what pictures we were struggling with. now. Yes, Very good. <laughs> yes. But uh, Facebook for um and instagram not so much but facebook because that's kind of the older generation likes that 
and they're the ones with the money. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but it is unbelievable to me our response and our response from so far away. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are really in; they're invested in St. Francis. Yeah. And uh, one, I think they know how much we appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Two, we're very transparent. Yeah. So they know that 96 cents out of every dollar, because we have to be audited, yep. does go to the direct care of the animals. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'm i out there mowing the yard. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, we love it. Yeah. I, when somebody, when somebody comes to St. Francis, I say, you know, you're going to drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. Because you will see, because people will say, oh, I can't come volunteer there. I can't stand to see the the animals. I want to take them Mm -hmm. all home. And I'm like, no, you will see how good of homes they get Mm -hmm. and how good of care they have. Because I don't feel sorry for any animal that we have. I feel sorry for the animals that we don't have. Yeah. And uh, so it's it's been amazing when we get in, oh, you know, like right now we have 21 puppies in our nursery. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, so each of those litters will go through six or seven cans of puppy food a day. So that's a lot of puppy food. Yeah. And uh, so all we have to do is put it out on Facebook. And pretty soon we have people dropping off cans. We have delivery. You know, the post uh, mailman or the mail person Mm -hmm. hates us. (laughs) (laughs) I believe that. Large so, boxes of yes, heavy cans yes, of dense yes. food. We are not very, you know, we're that's the only uh, problem <laughs> that we have, I think, in in all of of the area is yeah. uh, we have we have a lot of deliveries, and that's just because people are so very generous. Yeah. And, and uh, I think that they really know that we appreciate it and yeah. how much that is helping. Well, I mean, and, that, and that's a that's a kind of take note for the folks there with nonprofits that. Uh, that that may watch this right, or the folks that may serve on boards, or whatever else it may be, that that there is a there's a certain level of reciprocity that you have to have to the folks that provide for your organization that that make it happen, right? And there are lots of different ways in which to do that. But you're you guys are very much you you put that media in front of folks to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and you make sure that your that your individual donors, large or small, feel that. Yes, because. We, we don't have that many big donors. Yeah. We make our $600,000 by $25 here and $100 there yeah. and $5 here. And uh, it all adds up to keep our doors open. Yeah. And uh, I think that's important to people. I mean, I don't have any background in fundraising except that at SIU, yeah. we raised a lot of money and we're able to raise a lot of money at St. Francis. But it's, it's, uh, it's relationships with people that I think are the key. Yeah. Um, you need to you need to uh, be appreciative and show them. If I'm going to give a hundred dollars to somebody, I want to know what it's going for. Yeah. And so if when I know my hundred dollars at St. Francis is going to the care of a of a dog or a cat or a mm-hmm. puppy or a ki- or a kitten. Yep. It's not going to the CEO, which would be me because yeah. I make zero. <laughs> and that's, it, you know, that's like non-for-profits. If you look at a lot of the non-for-profits, mm-hmm. the CEOs are multimillionaires. Yeah. That's crazy. Too. Well, and there and there are there are different things where where some folks treat it like industry and some folks don't. I I myself I I've worked in whether it's volunteer or actual work in in attempt to fundraise for nonprofits, I, I've come up short on, on on my end before because of that exact issue, right? And it's because we we struggled as as an office to uh, you know uh, activate uh, our board, manage our administrative costs, and then I I failed to fundraise on the other side of that because it was very difficult to walk in and and make the argument, hey, please fund us. But also understand that part of that funding comes attached with administrative strings to it because we're trying to to stay afloat best we can. Right. The the other side of it is the changing of how nonprofit activity functions in this country, really just in the past twenty years. From where it was in 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 at the turn of the century to where we're at now, where it used to be, you know, organizations got together and they gave their money out and the organizations they gave their money to were the ones that just kind of did with it what they saw fit. Now it's a very hands-on approach. The folks that are that are engaged in the philanthropy from an organizational standpoint are they they want 
they want to guide it as them. They want a name on it. They want to, you know, they, they want to be active in the process, whether that's, you know, funding something specifically or whether that is starting their own foundation. Right. You know, um, and I, I, I mean, have, has that, have, have you seen outside of, you know, the, the, the social fundraising components, have you seen those same changes in your nonprofit activity alongside some of the, some of the larger folks that, that just have existed for some time? Well, uh, you know, I never want to take away from another nonprofit. That's oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, that is, you know, I'm I'm active in the honor flight. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I think in the women's center, you know, we're we're all really important. Yep. So you never want to rob Peter to pay Paul. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, you know, we we do. It it did hurt us when they took away the charity. Uh, deduction mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then they added another they added three hundred dollars back so is is this the most recent tax changes uh last year you could okay. you could if you took the standard form because mm-hmm. you know they raised that mm-hmm. uh people weren't itemizing okay so deductions didn't mean anything uh-huh um uh, so that was tough yeah we lost uh probably when that came into effect we probably lost 25 percent of our donations uh, and, then, you, and, and your goal is about six hundred thousand yes. dollars a year in fundraising. Yes, and we, yeah, we. It takes six hundred thousand dollars to keep our doors open. Now, some of that is made because we have adoption fees. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, we have a low income span neuter clinic, so you get your dog neutered. We make fifty dollars. Yeah. Uh, and the rest are fundraisers that we have: our golf scramble, our bike ride, our mm-hmm. yard sale. I mean, we're not above doing anything. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if it'll make some money, it'll make it some money. It makes money. <laughs> and then the rest is just simply nice people writing checks. Yeah. No, that that is – those are the components to it. That's you got, it. Got to work all angles. That's what keeps <laughs> us – you know, that's what keeps us uh, – going and uh and we were fortunate this past year during the pandemic we got some ppp money yeah uh we didn't close one day wow we kept all of our employees employed Mm -hmm. uh even during the scary times when we thought we were getting it from groceries yeah yeah uh we were very and and they were our employees are great because you know they make eleven dollars an hour that's minimum wage (laughs) Mm -hmm. they could have quit they could have sat at home and made more money yeah but they didn't yeah they showed up every day you know not knowing whether you know somebody was going to make them deathly ill Mm -hmm. uh but we tried to make little pods of workers where if somebody got it these people were only in you know affected or infected uh so we we managed that uh, I think remarkably well. And Kay Kreese, Dr. Kay Kreese, uh-huh. she's absolutely wonderful. She's our veterinarian and she's our accountant and, and she's, uh, she's, she's awesome. Did she administer the COVID shots when it came to fruition? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was all, that's always been an interesting thing to me as well. Cause like, so I, I will, I will admit, please don't hate me for it. Audience, please don't hate me for it. I'm not a pet person. I'm just, I've, okay. I, you're like, I'm out. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I should have just said, it was saying, I had, I got 20, 22 minutes to go That's and I it. couldn't make it past that. Rap my, cut. my, but well, my wife's a pet person. She makes up okay, for you it. Make up she, for it. she's, um, we have, we have in the house what she calls cat knacks that because I, I can't live with the cat. I get to live with a lot of cats. I get to live with little figurines of cats okay. all over the house. Three over the TV, three over the mantle, <laughs> one over on the floor here, five in the bedroom, one in the bathroom. They're there. <laughs> not, not as good as the real thing, but I agree. To each their own. To, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just bad in, in that way. But where, where was I going with this? It was, it was tied to COVID. Um, it was no, it wasn't tied to COVID. I'm sorry. The um, Dr. Kreese administering the, the shots. There we go. The the vet, the veterinarian and and the similarities between human medicine and veterinary. Uh, medicine that we're all, you know, just animals that are being worked on <laughs> at some at some point in and and way. And I, I, you're not a veterinarian yourself. I understand that, but I wasn't sure if she's ever been like, yeah, this is just like working on a kid who's got a boo boo on their arm or something. It, you know, there there are so many similarities, and the medicines are so similar. Uh, what people probably don't realize, if you get done with the prescription mm-hmm. and you don't need to take it anymore. There's a good chance that we could use it. Really? Yes. Okay. 
Yes. Antibiotics, I mean, there's not a dog antibiotic. The dosage, obviously, is different because, uh-huh. you know, we weigh a big dog is, you know, maybe 100 pounds mm-hmm. and a big person is more than that. So, uh, you know, a lot of the medicines that we take, our dogs take. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that's just another way you can give instead of throwing them away or at the uh, collection when mm-hmm. they, you know, collect the prescription drugs. Do you all publish a list of anything like that? or We or do, do you... have a, a on our website, okay. which I'm very proud of. Uh, there you go. We, we have a new website. We had volunteers that would run our re- website. Mm-hmm. And then... With COVID and everything being so tied to the internet yep. and, you know, needing to look at, at the dogs and cats online, uh, Idea Creative out of Murfreesboro mm-hmm. uh, did our whole website, designed it, didn't charge us a dime. Oh, that's phenomenal. So that, you know, we're so blessed yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, people people put the time in, but that's because you all put the time in. It's 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 really, you know, and we had a, a, a good website for volunteers, but mm-hmm. now you can go, you can find, you know, right away, adoptable dogs, yeah. application to adopt, uh, our history, our, our uh, audit reports, mm-hmm. because, um, you know, when, when we do have a gold star rating with, with the charity, uh, Guide Star, so we're proud of that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all that transparency is out there. Yeah. Has that... Is that- help to speed up and and i guess here here's another another good question so i i I have this issue in the group from time to time where where a no you can't bring pets in here and try and sell them if there are there are facilities that need you to a adopt the pets and if you're just trying to get rid of a pet you need to go talk to some of these facilities like that's that's it and i think it's also a facebook rule just the same that you can't um sell pets um or, or transact pets in that way um, and, and at the same time, folks that just come in and say, oh, well, I'm looking for a dog and I really want a dog really right now. Da, 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 da. There, you know, there's no really check or balance on, is that person ready for the responsibility of bringing in another animal into their life? Right. So while I was getting ready to ask, has the website helped streamline the process? My thought is also, well, you probably have some of the remaining checks and balances still in place to make sure that. Uh, you're you're not going too fast on some of the adoptions. We have a about as thorough of screening as we can have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our application to adopt is is a pretty healthy application. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we will call your landlord if you rent. We will call your veterinarian to make sure that your other pets are mm-hmm. on a heart prevent heartworm preventative uh-huh. on flea medicine. And you would be surprised at the applications that we turned down. Yeah. Uh, and especially during COVID when, you know, it became so popular to get an animal because mm-hmm. you were home. We, we did even more background checks because at this time when other shelters are getting some returns, mm-hmm. knock on wood, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think our investigation to make sure that they were good adoptions has yeah. really helped us. Now, of course... You know, sometimes it just doesn't work out. Yeah. And you sign a contract saying that if it doesn't work out, you're going to bring them back to us. Oh, so that there, there is an obligation built into that, that, that it's not just, oh, they're out our door. Good luck. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. No, you you um, you have to be you know, you have to have the application. I wish that we could do, you know, like some uh elite breeders do home visits mm-hmm. and stuff like that we can't do that no no that's we that's can't a... afford people you know the manpower to do that but uh we and there is uh among all of the the towns and the shelters and stuff there's a list mm-hmm. to do not adopt oh uh, okay and so once you get on that list you're not going to be able to adopt because mm-hmm. you either have had you know an animal out when it's been 10 below zero Mm -hmm. or you've had an animal outside and it's 106 degrees no water no shelter you'll get on that list Uh, and sorry go ahead no go ahead Uh, no i'm just i i'm thinking about a very particular incident that that uh, a friend was calling me with uh, uh, several weeks ago and asking well who who do i call do i call animal control do i call um the the shelter what you know what the process is if they see an animal that is that is being mistreated like that i mean do you do you have kind of a a a suggestive process for yes okay we by law can't go out and we're not animal control yeah 
we are a rescue that you bring them to us. Mm -hmm. And by law, we can't go out. And so uh, my phone number's out there. <laughs> yeah. And that's why I never answer if it's a, not a, a number that I know yeah. because I, you know, they want me to go out and, and I would love to go rescue every dog. Yeah. But that's not our, um, that's not our mission, yeah. nor can I do that. Yep. It's, it's not the law. But uh, animal control would be your first call. Mm -hmm. If they're not available, a police officer. Because there is a law in mm -hmm. Illinois, and I, it's a, I'm, there's a federal law. The, the part that's bad about the law, it's a little bit ambiguous. Mm -hmm. It just says life-threatening conditions. So yeah. um, what's life-threatening for a little chihuahua is different than a big husky in yeah. the winter. So um, it's hard to say, you know, all dogs have to have, you know, be inside if it's 10 degrees because, you know, a big dog with a lot of hair is going to be able to survive that where a little dog's not. Mm -hmm. So we have laws and it's, it's hard for police officers to enforce them because mm -hmm. they're ambiguous. They're ambiguous. Yep. Yes. Yep. But there, but there is a, a, a level of escalation a, along the line and that, that's good to know. That is yes. ultimately what I had, what I tried to connect, um, you know, my friend with was like animal control. Yes. Go, animal go. control is your first, your first call. And then the police, your second call. Very good. Very good. I appreciate that. That's very valuable information yes. that not everybody oh, knows or understands. It is. We answer a lot of calls every day mm -hmm. with those numbers. <laughs> you guys may, you guys might as well have your own call center on top of all the other stuff that you do with the... Well, we pretty much do. We, <laughs> we realize that, uh, you know, we'd outgrown. We have a big... We have four lines coming in now, mm -hmm. and, and we still get people that say... All I get is your voicemail. And I'm like, okay, we have two receptionists full time. They're on the phone all the time. Just keep calling. We'll call you back. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Well, one one of the things that you brought up that I that I found very interesting as well that, that I that I wanted to circle back to was the was the early days of social media and its impact on the the student life. And I mean, having having lived that firsthand and, and been part of that uh, policy making apparatus. I mean, what what was it like when this stuff first came on the scene and you were kind of like the the front row adult to this newfangled way that folks would engage and communicate? It was you know, you you uh, you live it. And you don't realize what an impact it's going to have. Yeah. But, but I know exactly. It was it was uh, probably 1995, 96, mm -hmm. uh, and you know I had a great team, and they had Facebook accounts, and then all of a sudden, uh, one of the the uh, uh, oh I I can't even think of what what we call them, but they help them with the study tables and stuff. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Uh, in athletics, I'm I'm, I'm the, drawing the, a blank. The, the, but they would monitor social mm -hmm. media. And they would pick out pictures of, you know, like a student athlete holding a beer mm -hmm. or at a party or, you know, something that wouldn't portray them in the best light. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I wasn't naive. I went to school. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, we're, we've, all, we've all been there and enjoyed ourselves like that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but you do have responsibility as a student athlete. Yep. You're on scholarship. You're, you are a role model, whether you want to be or not. Yep. Uh, so it was a real struggle. We didn't realize, I mean, at that point, Facebook was a flash in the pan. We yeah. didn't know if it was going to stay or, Absolutely. you know, hang there, around. There have been, or, you know, been thousands of others before, exactly. be plenty after. and Exactly. MySpace. I remember yeah. MySpace, <laughs> you know. But uh, finally, I think, you know, we even made a policy in athletics that student athletes couldn't have Facebook accounts. Mm -hmm. And there was a real pushback on that because, uh, you know, you – when you become part of a team, mm -hmm. uh, like as, as their coach, I had the authority to say you cannot have a nose piercing. Yeah. Or you cannot have an eyebrow piercing mm -hmm. because things like that, you know, back in the 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. nobody had stuff like that. Yeah. And so um, and you could say no facial hair if on the baseball team and, you know, make your – athletes student athletes, you know, the male athletes cut their hair mm -hmm. um so it was uh then we kind of realized oh i think this is is a dr west quote uh -huh. pick your battles <laughs> pick your battles and so it was you know it wasn't too long after you know facebook became so popular mm -hmm. that it was okay you can have the facebook accounts but you've got to be responsible yeah 
and and that's part of growing up. They have yep. to learn that. And what? people, you know, right now, I I read things on on Twitter and and other things on the internet that I'm like, what are you thinking? <laughs> A future employer is going to read this, and mm-hmm. you're never going to get hired. Yeah. You know what are you thinking? Yep. Well, so, and it's it's so funny. The the other side of it is is eventually. We'll get into a world where everybody's so far out there that it'll just be the norm. Now that's that's probably a generation or two off from when I that hope happens. It's off. <laughs> because you know the the hostility that somebody that you know is yeah, that's fair. Some yeah. screen name that's not theirs and yep. not going to be identified with them, and what they say and what they put out on social media yep. and the attacks of of our movie stars and yeah. and everything is sad to me. Yeah. It's uh there's there's no filter and that is uh social media is great for some things and other things really tough. It's it's yeah, it's not good for our society. I I I live I live walking on the edge of the double-edged sword that is. I understand it. <laughs> to to the nth degree. You are you are absolutely correct. Um no, the uh, where, where was I? Where was I going with this? Oh, it was on on to on to Doctor West uh, next because that you ju- you just uh, you know made a mention of 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 something that would sound like a quote from her directly. Um, you know, I I know what it's like to to have mentorship in the direction that I'm looking to go uh, in, in life and solidify, solidify myself, my career and all that fun stuff. And I don't know if you, if you had a mentor, uh, leading up to your relationship with Dr. West, but was your, was your, or has your relationship with Dr. West been one that has just been a, a longstanding mentorship that's helped you guide you through so many different components of life? Oh, big time. Cause she was my boss. Uh, when I, I got here, uh, she was, they had just combined men and women's athletics. Uh huh. And Jen Livengood was the athletic director, but Charlotte was still over all the women's programs. Mm -hmm. So she was my boss for till she retired. Uh, So that was probably 15 years Mm -hmm. that uh, she was my boss. And she was tough because we were friends, but she could chew me out. Yeah. And then ask me to dinner, you know, two seconds later, (laughs) you know. Uh, So um, she's she's one of my best friends and and. Definitely a mentor. Yeah. Because she, you know, I think, you know, my opportunities were okay because of the sports I, you know, because of golf, mm-hmm. I had the opportunity. But because of people like Charlotte West, uh, women now have the opportunity they have because she she was in there with Title IX. She was pushing Title IX. And, and she's, a, she's a walking uh, encyclopedia yeah. on Title IX. And, uh, you know, the the – the young ladies now, I don't think they have any idea yeah. that we didn't have those opportunities. Yeah. That they're just, you know, scholarships. Here, here's scholarships. Yeah. Here's, you know, opportunities to travel, compete, and and uh, that wasn't always like that. Well, and it's a feeder to so many different levels of uh, you know the the fight for for gender equity in sport, right? That I'm that I'm you know w- without without having any context whatsoever of of Charlotte's story, uh, which I, I'm I'm so thrilled that she was kind enough to be like, I'll come back Wednesday. You fix your technical problems. You be on time for Diane, because she's not gonna she's not gonna be I know, okay if you're late. Patience is not <laughs> patience is virtue. It's just not mine. <laughs> um, it was it was wonderful. I've never I, I I had a I had a technical glitch happen for for an event Saturday night as well. My heart sank and it took me three minutes to fix that. But this afternoon had been different. So when she was just like, let me go. <laughs> let's let's do this again. I was like Wednesday. She's like yes, Wednesday. I was like oh, yeah. oh, thank goodness. I'm not. I didn't just look because she was talking to me too. She's like you know I'm, I'm getting a li- I'm, I'm I'm about at the end of wanting to do any more of these interviews. And I was like oh no, if I don't get her today, she's never gonna want to come back. <laughs> she's, it- <laughs> she's amazing and and what you know what she fought for and and the the opportunities that women have mm-hmm. and uh, oh my gosh. You know, she should have been the athletic director here several times over. Yeah. Because we had a balanced budget then. Uh, <laughs> we had winning programs mm-hmm. then. Uh, you know, we weren't ten million dollars in the hole. Yeah. Well, and and um, the uh, where where are you going? I keep losing my trains of thought here. I'm sorry. The um, t- 
Title IX's uh, and, and, and her work's impact on not just sport at the collegiate level, right? You know, it's, it's amazing to see our Salukis competing at a global level right now, right? But the steps that have had to be taken to get to this point, um, you know, when you look at something like the women's soccer team for the U.S. having finally the capacity to leverage what they should have always had the capacity right. to leverage, which was their ability to compete, uh, right. you know, at, at the scale that they do. Um, and just and they win. Yeah. You know, the men's soccer team doesn't win anything. They lose. And they make millions. Yep. And the women's, you know, just the, uh, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's fun to see uh, the opportunities and like Deanna Price, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sponsored by Nike and yeah. this meat company. And, you know, she lives by me and she's got this wonderful uh, weight room in her garage. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's, she's being rewarded for all of her hard work. Yeah. No, and I, I'm excited. I've, uh, I've, at some point in time, uh, earlier in the year, I was set to have her on. She got the COVID shot. She was like, "Today's not the day," and we just haven't had a chance to hook up since. That happens pretty regularly with these podcasts. I've got probably a dozen people that I've that I've been talking to for six months trying to find the right lineup here. And now that she's in the Olympics and and going through all of this activity now, which was all all but a guarantee, right? Um, but now my my hope is that on the other end of this, she'll come back with. Right. Oh, you know. she will. She's so down to earth. <laughs> yeah. She's so down to earth, and she. She's never uh, forgotten her roots. Yeah. And, you know, her giving back to SIU and, you know, she's never she she will never get the big head. Now, do she you get won't. do you get involved with the pumpkin race, too? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's the pumpkin smasher. Uh huh. And I'm the judge. There we go. Yes. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a little it's a little show yeah. that oh, goes yeah. on. It's oh. a dog and pony show, but I'm not sure which of us is the dog and which of us is <laughs> which the, pony. the pony. But uh, yeah, she's the pumpkin smasher, and I deem the the pumpkin eligible to be smashed. <laughs> oh, I love that. I'm gonna we're we're gonna. I, I don't know. I don't know if you've caught a, a pumpkin judging uh, on on camera yet, but I feel like this year, if we if we get a return to it, I'm gonna show up with a with a video camera and a, and a oh, boom yeah. mic and we'll, we'll turn it into a, to a whole production for you. We'll <laughs> see how that goes. I uh, get involved with, with all that kind of stuff in, in auctioning. Yeah. Uh, before COVID I would auction for all these, you know, events and I would just say I'm loud and I'm free. Yeah. So why not? <laughs> that is that is the shtick that I need to go for. I kept I kept, I keep trying to figure out how do I best sell myself to organizations and tell them that I want to be you know work you know help do helping them in some sort of way using my special set of skills. And I've never thought to just say I'm loud and I'm free. I'm loud and I'm free. <laughs> That's what you know. After I retired, especially you know, I had opportunities to be on boards and stuff, and I'm mm-hmm. like, no, because I don't want people not to answer my call when yeah. I call them. Yeah. If I go to the well too many times, and mm-hmm. St. Francis is, you know, SIU Golf will always be, you know, one of my charities. Yeah. But St. Francis is is my, it has my heart now. But you know, if you need me to auction, if yep. you need me, if you need somebody loud and free, I'll help you with your event. Well, and th- and that works out because what that what that is is, the organization bringing you know, uh, the, the ladder to the fruit, right. You're just going to climb it and pit, help them pick it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and I make sure that, you know, you're carrying it with you, you when you go, believe it. <laughs> uh, I'm a walking billboard. Uh, I mean, it, it, it works. It, it works. It's, it's, you know, the, the same thing that, that we, that we got to do here. It's, it's carry it with you everywhere you go. And I, and I work really diligently and, and our whole team works very diligently here, um, you know, to find these intersections where as a, as a community space, right, that this space can be something that serves whoever walks through our door, right? The Rainbow Cafe uh, this weekend with all of our pride events were phenomenal. And we didn't intend to, to, you know, end up being a fundraiser for, you know, two or three different organizations along the way, but we did and we have. See, that's nice. That's you know, great. And and we and we derive value from it ourselves. I mean, we we had, you know, sold out shows and nice. you know, live streams on, you know, from the street and and just all of these different things that came together. And that's it. You find your way to be a resource for others, but you always understand of, you know, who your number one is as Diane or as Nathan or as, you know, whoever whoever that may be out there. So Right. Exactly. Oh. 
This is this is some good this is some good reassurance that you know for for probably a handful of folks out there that we're doing some of this nonprofit stuff the right way, and I appreciate that. Well, you didn't <laughs> have to ask me twice to come here because yeah. you know I get to talk about myself, get to talk about San Francis SIU. So hey, I'm here. <laughs> Ooh, that was loud. Uh, <laughs> the um, what has it been like? And, and this will this will be kind of my my close out here, and very much just a just a personal. Uh, relationship between uh, you and you and SIU and having gone through uh, you know a pivotal uh, time in in SIU's life. I mean to to still be here and to still be contributing uh, at at the at the times when we need it most. I mean, do you still feel very duty bound uh, to this school and to this place and all of the work that you do for it? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, I. Um I will, I will, I didn't go to SIU, but I will always love SIU. Yeah. Um, Danielle Kaufman played golf for me. She's the coach now. Really? Uh, so, you know, I've gone a couple trips with them. Mm -hmm. You know, I go to practice. I'm the volunteer coach. <laughs> uh, so I'm still very involved. I'll help her with her fundraiser, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hit shots and sell jello shots. And, <laughs> you know, it's. Yeah, I'm always going to to be involved with SIU golf. Always. That's phenomenal. Yeah. So um, it's you know it, it it was my life for 25 years. Yeah. So I will always be a Saluki. <laughs> the I, I love that one of your students went on to be the coach in yeah. in place here. I mean, what what type of a I mean that that feels like above any championship ring. Yeah. Above any 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 competition that you would ever be in and and succeed at, to see somebody that you have invested so much time and effort into achieve the same level that that you are. I mean, what what is the feeling like there? Well, I was so proud of her. Um, I was uh, Jerry Kill was the athletic director, mm -hmm. and he called me and he's you know I love Jerry. He's like, okay, you and me, we're gonna we're gonna hire this golf coach. <laughs> And uh, so she was coaching at Wren Lake, mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, I've got, I've got the candidate. Yep. I have another young lady that was the, the assistant at the Naval Academy, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was kind of between the. But we couldn't get Kelly's husband a job. He was a big, he's a big time attorney yeah. with the Senate in Washington. Yeah. So uh, that didn't work out. But Danielle, it's a great fit. Uh, she named a tournament after me, and so that's pretty cool. <laughs> and so it's it's uh, it's been fun to to uh, to stay involved. Yeah, uh, I mean, and that's that is what keeps the 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 richness alive in this place is that passing of the torch. Yes, you know, to to be able to know that you know legacy isn't so much what you've done individually, but what other individuals are able to do with the work that you've already put in to this point that's um that's where i think that we we need to probably do a little better job at siu our turnover with our administration is so great yeah i can't tell you how many presidents and chancellors i had in mm -hmm. my 25 years there uh but there's so many people that have dedicated their entire life mm -hmm. charlotte west uh you know, I could just go down the line yeah. of people that have spent their whole career here mm -hmm. and their love of SIU. And so sometimes when SIU does get derailed, it's because they forget those people. Yeah. Yep. And and uh, that's what makes the place. I'm I'm working on. You'll 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 like this one. I've I've got uh, I've got a good relationship with with Emil Spees. I don't know if you're familiar. Sure. Uh, the but he's. And he's got some of that institutional knowledge floating around up there as well that says, hey, here's here's where the people are that have been along the way this whole time. Like, don't forget these stories yes. of the people that that poured in 30, 50, 70 and an entire life into this place because they're the ones that are the underpinning of what has always made this place a success. Exactly. And when, you know, we had a basketball program that maybe wasn't so successful but we still had all these season ticket holders mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden we make it to the sweet 16 yeah. and we're big time and then now the season ticket holder that's been a season ticket holder for 30 years you don't get those seats unless you give us ten thousand dollars that's not right yeah and that uh you know 
it wasn't for me to say, but that's that's not how you treat your loyal mm -hmm. uh, customers. And that's what people are. Yeah. They're customers. Yep. Well, and that goes right back into perfect spot to close out here. Uh, just exactly why your delivery of appreciation from St. Francis keeps your organization in, uh, you know, the 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 well-groomed pet jokes, da da da, shh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> manner that it is. So I, I guess cl closing out on this, St. Francis Care.com. What's what is your website if people are looking to? Yes. Okay. It's. Uh... San Francis, mm -hmm. uh, little slash, uh -huh. care, dot org. Dot org. Perfect. But I'm so proud that if you Google San Francis, you used You're... to get the hospital, and uh -huh. you get some churches. Now we come up. <laughs> so enough people have searched us that mm -hmm. if you just Google San Francis, we're right up there. Hey, you, so you can go to our website. You, you've got it. You've, you've worked. If you're beating the hospitals and the churches as the <laughs> as the shelter for that St. Francis St. Francis top spot, you do a pretty good job, Diane. We we uh, you know back to Facebook. We have about thirty thousand followers yep. on Facebook and and uh, you know the top Google spot. So we're doing something right. No, oh, that is that is. Too true. And I think we've done something right here for this podcast, episode 73 of the WTF Carbondale podcast with Diane Doherty. Uh, thank you so much, Diane. I thank really you. appreciate thank it. Thank you for the opportunity um, to talk about SIU and St. Francis and my favorite subject, me. That's <laughs> you, you and me both, girl. Um, have a good one, folks. Whatever that one may be. <laughs>